uh, the, ne- the next few hours together, uh, we're going to, at least I'm going to be dealing with some very practical matters, applications of the doctrine that we've been laying down and continue to expand it. Now, we're going to have a, a question and answer time with the speakers at the end of the conference. There's a, a sheet of paper you can write questions down, and uh, there's a box in the back. It's right by the door, and you can drop your questions in there. So I'm sure if you have any questions, we'd, really, we'd love to try to answer them and, and try to help you know, with that. Also, too, I want to point you to a number of resources that we have back here. You know, we've been publishing uh, doctrinal matters on family life and church life for many years. Uh, you should check out Theology of the Family. It's a monstrous book. It's 500 years of biblical wisdom. Most of this is wisdom not in the 20th century or the 21st century. A lot of, t- you know, the doctrine of the family was destroyed in the 20th century. You know, reading 20th century and 21st century writers on the family, you know, can be problematic because they lost the doctrine. But not the Puritans, not the Reformers. This, these are the old guys. Here's the, here's the beauty of this book. It addresses every manner of family life, but in two to three page sections. Like, it looks so daunting, doesn't it? But it's really not because the articles are short and you can digest them you know, in a, in a 10 minute reading with your family and you're done with that section and it's really good. The first chapter on, is on family worship. There are 12 short chapters on family worship. It's worth the price of the book. One time our church uh, every month read one of these chapters, but uh, everything about manhood and womanhood and marriage and childbearing and anything else you can imagine is addressed in this book. We've been in Deuteronomy 6. We've talked about you know, uh, filling your family with the knowledge of God through the Word of God. Here's a book that I wrote um, a couple of years ago called Journey Through the Bible. Uh, this is designed as kind of a cheat sheet for families. In this book, you'll find uh, a very quick summary of every book of the Bible, questions to ask your children, a, uh, a timeline involved, and a hymn to sing for every book of the Bible that, uh, that I feel sums up the whole message of that book. Uh, Teach your children the Bible. Read the Bible through with your family over and over again. You go from Genesis to Revelation every year. That's my command to all families. And what happens is that you end up with the language and the knowledge of God. And it's really important. Journey through the Bible. Take a look at it. It's a beautiful book, and it's laid out very generously. Um, I really recommend recommend that to you. Um, uh, there, are, there are several things I want to talk about uh, as the day goes on here uh, regarding these resources because we've connected resources with the things that we're, we're dealing with right now in this conference. Now, this morning, I'm going to be working through applications of the doctrine that we've been laying down. And I'm going to, uh, in this first message, I'm going to be dealing with matters of womanhood, of gender justice, of the doctrine of personhood, and and how that applies in church life and family life and civil life and having lots of babies so that the word of God is not blasphemed. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. And then in my next message, just before lunch, I'm going to talk about dealing with children, Uh, children in the church, child discipline, the use of the rod, bringing order to the home. And then finally, uh, in, in my last message of the day, I, I'm going to talk about the orderliness of the home. I'm going to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and the aroma of the home and the kind of kingdom that God desires us to establish in our homes. So that's where I'm going uh, today. And I want to begin with womanhood and gender justice and the doctrine of personhood and having lots of babies and how the new gender justice is really causes the word of God to be blasphemed. The devil's attacks on women are relentless. They're discouraging. And they're all aimed at personhood. They're aimed right at the heart of personhood in terms of womanhood. I was so grateful for Carrie's exposition of these things, laying down a foundation. But the devil devil seeks to deface womanhood and and to distort her. You know, a lot like the cubism of 
of Pablo Picasso, how he distorted the imagery of women and, and bifurcated and fragmented a woman and make her look like nothing like she really looks like. This is what modern feminism is doing to women. It's cubism. And they contort women and they make her most unlike her nature. You know, you can, you can, you, you know, Bruce Jenner can put lipstick on, but everybody knows who that, who, what person we're dealing with here. And uh, so we're dealing really with some of the detailed matters of complementarianism and, and the equality of women as persons with men, the distinctions with, of masculinity and femininity and the roles and the very nature that God has invested in manhood and in womanhood. And, uh, you know, the, these matters are all ro wrapped up in, in the new religion. It's the new just, social justice religion. It's a religion. And it, and, and it, it encompasses every, every part of life. The, the church should be very concerned about justice. Justice is God's word, but when you add social justice to it, you've added a different word, and it becomes redefined. And, but God has communicated a comprehensive vision of justice. And it really impinges on this matter of, of gender justice. And uh, th thankfully, God, through the general equity of his own law, communicates to us what is just. You know, Moses said, don't pervert justice. That's what we're seeing happening today. Now, you pervert justice when, when you divert from the justice of God. And uh, so we're dealing here with, with gender justice, personhood, I, uh, what uh, is called identity politics. And, you know, there, there are radical movements that are taking hold, particularly in young people's minds, that, that really defeat and deface the very nature of personhood that's presented in the Bible, pretending that there's no difference in roles of, of men and women. And there is a difference, and they're fixed, and you, and you shouldn't be messing around with them. You know, I, I came over here on a Boeing 737, and, you know, it, uh, it had an engine and it had wings. Now, which was the most important in its function, the engine or, or the wings? It's a little bit like, you know, which is more important, which is more pivotal, which is more powerful, the paint or the paintbrush? Well, this is how God has designed for manhood and womanhood. And don't tell the passengers that they're better off if the engine stops doing its job and wants to be a wing. Don't tell the passengers that. That's insanity. And that's exactly what we're doing now with personhood. We're saying you're actually better off doing something different than what you were created to do. Uh, because in God's creation order, there are particular roles. They are fixed in nature. Uh, they're not options. They they are so fixed in nature, they're obvious to everyone, including the person who's looking down at themselves to figure out what gender they are. But, uh, you know, uh, the passengers are not better off if the engine wants to go trans and become a wing. And it's the same way with, with gender. And so I, I, I'd like to deal with these matters of, of gender and social justice. We, you're living in a world right now where people think that, that gender is a social construct. It's not biological. But it is biological. You know, most people, you know, have grasped that. But that's being, you know, confused and, and contorted today. And, you know, the new social justice warriors suggest that justice demands that referring to people by their biological sex is oppressive. You're oppressing someone if you call them by the gender of their creation. And uh, so many in new invented genders are on the table. On Facebook, 58 of them, uh, to name them. Uh, the new morality is that transgender is not just good, it must be celebrated. And if you don't celebrate it, you are on the wrong side of history. And if you, if you contradict the claim of this new revolution, you're not inclusive, you're unjust, you're misogynistic, you're homophobic, you're mean-spirited, and frankly, you are unsafe. You are not making safety for people in this world. And uh, the truth is, you know, explaining or preaching the biblical moral code 
regarding manhood and womanhood is considered injustice. And they suggest that upholding justice the way the Bible defines justice is harmful to society. You know, Christians probably aren't going to go to jail over the gospel. They're going to go, they're, they're going to, go to jail over personhood and man made in the image of God, which actually is inextricably tied to the gospel. Um, you know, various other Christian doctrines are considered racist and non-inclusive. And the, the proposition of modern man is you can make yourself anything you want to be. And by, way, by the way, that's not really very modern. Uh, this is Rousseau. This is Freud. These are the great feminists of the 20th century. The first wave, second wave, third wave feminists all said the same thing. You can be anything you want. Go, girl. Be anything you want. And guess what? You, you, in in contrary, contrast to that, you've actually been created in the image of God as male and female. And these are fixed natures that God has established. And... Uh, it's, it's very important that we understand that these matters of gender justice really are debates over personhood. You know, who are you? Um, it's very important that you know who you are. And when you find yourself saying, I don't know who I am anymore, it's really a sign that you've become disconnected from biblical truth about who you are. And actually your biological constitution, uh, which is fixed in you. Um, uh, the, the doctrine of the personhood uh, in the Bible is very clear that we, we are made in man's image and that you are created either as male or as female. And these things actually determine who you are and what you are to do in the world, because God created everything this way with a particular function. You pull, you pull one element of functionality out of nature, and things go haywire. You, we, we understand that. In, in, in the matter of the ecosystem, if you pull one element out, you damage it. You actually affect other parts. And that's the same thing with gender. <clears throat> and... Uh, our genders show us how we fit into the world. And they show us what we ought to do with our lives. And it's very critical that we understand that. Um, God has established in his order of creation a, a beauty and a functionality of what is male. And a beauty and a functionality of what is female. And it's ludicrous to try to say that they are the same and make everything the same. Anyone who's ever used tools understands this, right? There are certain tools for certain jobs. You know, most fathers have encountered their sons trying to turn the wrench into a hammer, and they have to instruct them, no, use the hammer, because a hammer is used for one thing and a wrench is used for another. Well, the whole, the whole of creation and the whole of the innovations of mankind bear witness to this matter of usefulness. And we were created for a particular use. And we can always say, I know who I am, and I know what my function is, and I know what I ought to do with my life. And your gender tells you a boatload about that. And you can try to be like Bruce Jenner and put lipstick on it, but you can't cover it up because it's part of the creation order. You know, you don't mess with Mother Nature. And so I'd like to just speak about this matter, uh, you know, because it's, it, it's a very controversial and divisive and disruptive matter in the world. And Christians have to decide whether they're going to believe whether God made man as male or female or not. And they're going to have to ask whether it's appropriate to play pretend with the world on this matter. Uh, um, this is a matter of the distinctiveness of the church and the world. And uh, it marks the distinctive nature of Christianity and its view of personhood and identity 
and sexuality and manhood and womanhood and their roles. So it's a very serious matter, and it's a threat to biblical Christianity. Uh, these things pose a threat to God's moral and doctrinal and relational functionality that he's designed. It's messing with his design. And, uh, you know, I, I pray that, that uh, you're comforted by God's design. You can, set, you can rest in it. You can settle it and say, yes, I, I am a man. I am a woman. I was created to do particular things. You know, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Feminine by Design. I actually wrote it to, to try to document what I was trying to teach my daughters. And I'll just read you a few words from the preface of the book. The world needs Christ-loving, husband-helping, homemaking, dominion-taking, kingdom-making women. The Bible not only teaches women to be possessors of a gentle, quiet, and spirit, gentle and quiet spirits, but it also teaches them to exercise their God-given wisdom and strength. They are vigorous, strong, and distinctively feminine. They are supremely secure and not frightened by any fear. They're brimming with confidence in the future, and they're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They're happy because they fear the Lord and love His ways. Their worth is far above rubies, and they bring gain to their households. They are girded with strength, and their clothing is of fine linen. The law of kindness is upon their lips. They do their husbands good all the days of their lives. They are pillars, sculpted in palace style, with adornments that radiate the beauty of Christ and diffuse the fragrance of the aroma of Christ in every place. This book contains the material that makes a woman look like this. Well, the Bible makes a woman look like this. And so this book really extracts 12 particular passages of Scripture that, that describe womanhood. And I, 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 but I, I, I want to commend the whole matter of, of womanhood to us. Now, there are, there are many illustrations of the cultural and the personal challenges on this matter of, of, of gender justice. <clears throat> it's become unjust to refer to a man as male or female. And in the world that we live in today, your biological nature the nature of your body, the, the, the structure of it, the very making of it, it has nothing to say about who you are. That's why in Berkeley, California, you're not allowed to call them manholes anymore. Uh, they are not allowed to have policemen. Uh, no more man-made, but human-made. Uh, so you can take your manhole and make it a maintenance hole, but everybody knows what it is. And, uh, you know, we're no longer asking children to grow up like ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, um, just a few weeks ago, uh, the presidential candidate, Joe Biden, uh, on his campaign trail, I think he was in Iowa, asked how many genders there were. He said, there are three. There are three. Interesting. You know, um, a few weeks ago, one of my daughters had a baby in a hospital, and she was, she was surprised because the induction forms had been changed, and they were asking her to, <clears throat> to name what pronouns she decided to go by. And she was talking to one of the nurses about it, and she said, oh, well, you, don't, you haven't seen it all yet. You know, we've, we, we, we were just instructed to change the colors on the bassinets, you know, instead of blue for boys and pink for girls, now they're gender neutral colors. And she said, oh, really? She said, oh, that's not the end of it. I just walked into a room where a baby had just been born. And I walked into the room and the parents were there. And I said, is it a boy or a girl? And the mother said, we're going to let the child decide. Okay. Um, you know, this, the induction forms are being changed in, in almost every hospital in America. And this is, this is what we're dealing with here. Uh, and there really is no gender spectrum. There's male and female. There are, there are male chromosomes. There are fem female chromosomes. And every single cell of the human body contains gender code, whether male or female. The code is there. And you can't change it. Unless you want to play pretend. Unless you want to try to make up your own life your own way unless you want to let your emotions run your life rather than actual physical things that are fixed in nature. 
Let's talk about the Word of God on personhood. Um, I'm going to just run us through some passages of Scripture very quickly. We don't really have time to 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 uh, explain every one of them. <clears throat> but in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, let's be very clear. God made man male and female. There's no such thing as transgender. Homosexuality is a sinful inclination of the affections of the heart. It is not a biological reality. You were made male. If you don't want to be male, then you are rebelling against your nature. And... Um, it's very, very clear. The, the, the Bible just does not recognize this matter of, of transgender. Uh, the Bible is explicitly and unassailably and unchangeably gender binary. You got that? The scripture is explicitly, unassailably, and unchangeably gender binary. Well, what's gender binary? Gender binary means that there are two sexes, and they are biologically determined, and they are fixed. And the Bible makes it clear that these genders bear witness to two different roles associated with those sexes. And we, that's why we have always classified people as male and female. And uh, as a result of the sexual revolution, people now think uh, on two planes, the biological plane and the emotional plane, the emotional plane of their sinful inclinations. Um, you, you've heard the term gender dysphoria. What is, what is gender dysphoria? What does it mean? Dysphoria means dissatisfaction with something. It's unhappiness with something. So gender dysphoria is dissatisfaction with your gender. It's, it's unhappiness with what God did when he made you. It's rejecting God's creation order. And, but in Christianity, we're not disappointed with God. We're not disappointed with how he created. We want to walk as Christ walked. Uh, and our minds are being renewed. Um, Genesis 2.18, God creates a helper for the man. This, is, this reveals the role of a woman. The woman is designed to be a helper. It's, and, and, and to make her not a helper of her husband is as silly as having the 737 airplane engine decide that it wants to be a wing. A, a woman has been created to be a helper. This is part of her nature. In, you know, in many ways, she can't help herself. It's one of the most beautiful parts of womanhood. You, you can't deny it. Women have this inclination in their hearts. Now, when it's low, when it's dull, it's always because of sin. But women were made in order to be helpers. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 20 through 25, the woman was created to marry a man, and a man was created to marry a woman. That should tip you off at the ridiculous proposition of, I hate to even use the term, gay marriage. Those are, it's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as gay marriage. In Genesis 3.16, the woman is designed to have a husband and bear children. And in Genesis 3.16 as well, a woman is designed to be under the authority of the husband. He shall rule over you. In Genesis 3.20, Eve is the mother of all living. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Adam knew that. Adam knew what she was going to do. She was going to go fill the earth with babies who would grow up and create more babies. In Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, we learn that men should, uh, men should wear clothing that is distinctively masculine and women should wear apparel that is distinctively feminine. Moses says, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor a man to put on a woman's garment. In other words, men and women should be distinctively feminine. You should raise your daughters to, to look distinctively feminine. And, and that might look differently in different cultures, but they need to, be, they need to look distinctively feminine mod and, and modest at the same time. In Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, the, a sign of a society in collapse is characterized by women and children who are ruling. 
In Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, wives are commanded to be submissive and respect their husbands, and the husbands are commanded to love and serve their wives. They have particular, particular inclinations toward one another in their genders. In 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15, women are to learn in silence in the church. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence, for Adam was formed first. Well, you know, th th these are just the plain words of Scripture. It's, it's you know, I went to seminary. I, I've read these theologians about these matters. But the words mean exactly what they sound like. You don't need, you don't need theological gymnastics to deal with this passage. It's very, very clear. These are the plain words of Scripture. But what this, what this does is it makes... It makes the primary focus of a woman in a church a learner. She is to vacuum up every good thing from the word of God. And if she has a question to ask her husband at home, she should be well instructed and quietly receive the instruction and build up the arsenal of doctrine in her heart so she can pour it out on her children so she can be very, very clear and very powerful in the communication of the truth of God to her children and to her husband and, and when she grows older to the younger women in the church. A woman should be very well educated. In 1 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7, women are to dress in a certain way and conduct themselves with their husbands with the hidden person of the heart, which is really the power of the Holy Spirit working in her life, trusting God and helping her husband in ways that are a blessing. In Romans chapter 1, Verses 25 to 27, there's a natural and there's an unnatural use of female and male bodies. In other words, you can misuse your male body and you can misuse your female body. And the way that the Apostle Paul says you misuse it is if you pretend that you're a different gender. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14, there's a distinction even between the hair of men and women and it matters. Does not even nature teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. Hair is different. You know, it is. Well, it is. It really is interesting. You know, men, men's hair, you know, goes haywire. Uh, women's hair is beautiful. You know, it's there. It's a crown of glory, and w women's hair is is beautiful. It's very different. There's a distinction between the hair of men and women. In First Corinthians eleven, three through seven, the the male and female distinctions are to be maintained in the church. In 1 Corinthians 11, 8 through 10, the woman was created for man. In 1 Corinthians 11, 11 through 12, a man ought not be independent of a woman, and a woman ought not to be independent from a man. In John chapter 10, we learn that the scripture cannot be broken. Uh, the Bible really does tell you who you are. You need to know who you are, you know. The devil first attacked Eve on this matter of which kingdom did she want to follow? God's kingdom or the kingdom of her own heart that she would follow? And so God, God has spoken and scripture really cannot be broken. You know, I, let's talk about gender roles. You know, there are, there's this term uh, complementarianism. We've, we've dealt with it here uh, already at this conference. I, I was very grateful for that. Um, complementarianism asserts that there are particular roles for males and females in the home and in the church. And the question is, are, why? Well, the answer is nature. Uh, women are of a particular nature, and they have roles. Now, my view, my, my view is that women's roles follow in every sphere of jurisdiction in society. Many evangelicals subscribe to a two-point complementarianism, and that women have a particularly defined role in the church and in the home. But what about the state? Uh, so should there be male, should there be female presidents? That's, that's the question. Now, I, I'm, I'm call, I call myself a three-point complementarian. 
I believe a woman's nature is fixed and it matters in every sphere and jurisdiction. And here's why I believe that the role of women is fixed by nature in all three spheres. First of all, I don't believe that a woman's nature or function changes when she crosses the threshold of the church or walks outside of her home. I think she's that whether she's in her home, whether she's in the church, or no matter where she is, because it is, it is the creation order. She was created to be a helper, not a leader. And the issue is that women were created for a specific function. They were created for man to be a helper. And you don't just change that by walking, off, walking across the threshold of a church. She doesn't change. The second reason is that in every case in the Bible, in every case in the Bible, you can check it out, civil magistrates are men. They are always men. They are never women. And uh, with the explicit order in Exodus 18.21, choose men. You see the same thing in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Now, the Bible doesn't, except for this command, choose men, the Bible doesn't say women can't be presidents women can't be civil leaders but the reason we believe that only men can be elders in the church is the only reference to elders in the church is to men the bible doesn't say women can't be elders the bible says that elders are men just by imp by implication it's the very same argument and if if someone says well a, a woman you know, a woman can't be an elder, but she can be the president. I, I'm just going to go back to what the scripture says. We, we came up with men elders with the exact same logic that we, ca that, that we, that we came up with, uh, with male presidents. And by the way, everybody thought this way <laughs> for, for millennia, except those who decided to set aside the word of God. Thirdly, when God chose kings for his people, they were always men. Fourth, a political career, in my view, violates her role as a keeper at home and a helper to her husband. Next, if a woman were president, would you be comfortable with her being an authority over every male in the United States? Next, if a woman were president, do you feel that her submission to her husband would now, through her, subject all Americans to his will, since she is obligated before God to submit to her husband, quote, in everything, Ephesians 5.24. Next, the basis for the right structure of the family and the church is taken from the creation order. And why would we look at the creation order and not apply it to the state? And the argument really against extending the nature of women to the civil realm is really an argument from silence. So... God made men and women different. My, my, I'm a three-point complementarian. I may be the only one in the room. I just wanted you to know why. God, for his glory, wanted to focus a woman on the most powerful and pivotal institution that he created for the, for the discipleship and the spreading of the gospel to children, and that is in the home. And he desired her to wrap all of her energies around that. And to give her whole heart, her whole life, to be a keeper at home. To be a blessing to the next generation. This is the gender binary of womanhood. And this, this kind of woman never has to ask, who am I? She knows who she is. Her body tells her who she is. Her natural inclinations tell her who she is. And she's not frightened by any fear. And the feminists want to frighten you away from the best work you'll ever do in your life. This is what the devil always does, by the way. He just wants to distract you from what is truly good. So, you know, my, my, message, my messages today are going to say very much the same thing. If you want to have a Christian family, then follow your gender identity and have lots of babies so far as it depends on you. Let's talk about babies. Have lots of babies. Have lots of babies. Well, I'm really just summarizing what the Bible says here. Um, I'm going to give you nine reasons why you should have lots of babies. If you're a woman, and if you're a husband, 
that you ought to just welcome it and bless it and do everything you can to support your wife. It's really time for Christians to buck the system here. You know, one of the things I'm really grateful for, um, you know, at the, in the NCFIC network of about 500 churches, in all these churches, they're having babies like crazy. And I am so thankful for that. They're almost the only subset of evangelicalism that's having babies. And they're having babies because of the Bible told them to have babies. That's why they're doing it. In fact, I just, I just had uh, a lunch in Texas with some of my old interns. We had a lunch. Some, I did a conference out there, and some of my old interns were there. And one of them came to me and said, could we invite our wives? And I said, absolutely. And then they said, could we bring our children? And I said, whoa, yeah. And there we were sitting there with all these little kids lined up in this restaurant, this massive group of husbands and wives. I, I had these guys when they were 18, 19, 20 years old, and now they're having babies like rabbits, and I praise God for it. You know, they were so happy. Their wives were so geared up. Well, they were tired for sure, but you know what? God made women to take the hit to raise the next generation, and it's hard and you husbands, I'm telling you, if your wife, you have a lot of babies, you better be helping your wife. You better work. You better be, you know, running interference for her. But nobody ever had a lot of babies without getting tired. It is, it is work. It's the kingdom work. It's taking dominion. Like when you're taking dominion, it's work. You're working at it. And it's hard, but it's beautiful, and you'll never regret it. Nine reasons why you should have babies. Nine arguments why you ought to have babies. Well, be, well, before we get to the arguments, there's one argument that really lies behind all of them. Are you ready for it? Before you can be born from above, you must be born on the earth. Okay? All the saints in heaven got their start as babies. Every child of God was first a child of a mother. And that's how important it is to have babies. What must be done for a soul to enter into heaven is to start with a baby on the earth. How about that? How many, how many of you have babies under two years old? Under two years old. Hands higher. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise God. That baby was born into the world so that you would preach the gospel and bring the sweetest kingdom to that baby and show them how good Jesus is so that they would go to heaven. That's why you should have lots of babies. And that's why Christians should have babies. Well, let's get to the big biblical arguments, okay? I'm going to give you nine, nine biblical arguments. First, God commands it. Commands it. Uh, actually, the first command in the Bible, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, Genesis 1.28. It's repeated again in Genesis 9, verses 1 and verses 7. This command was originally given to Adam and Eve, and it implies that believers in all ages are supposed to go on the offensive. We are not minimalists concerning babies. If you want to be a minimalist, you know, on the walls of your house, fine. But don't be a minimalist with babies. Second. God plans it. Uh, pregnancy and childbearing uh, do not depend entirely on you because God opens and closes the womb according to his own wisdom and sovereign hand. It was God who opened and closed the wombs of Sarah and Leah and Rachel and Hannah and Ruth. And because God is in control, believers should seek to be fruitful and multiply. It's the Christian thing to do. Number three. God desires godly offspring. You know, having children is something God desires. You know, the prophet Malachi made this very clear in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi asked the question, why marriage? Answer, God desires godly offspring. Give him what he wants. Go give God what he wants. He gave you a body. He gave you a husband. Go give God what he wants. Fourth, fruitful and multiplication are the means of building the kingdom of God. 
God's promises to Abraham and the blessings from Abraham were dependent on the multiplication of offspring as the stars of the heavens so that all the families of the earth should be blessed. Genesis 26, 4, Genesis 12, 2 through 3, and Genesis 15, 4 through 6. The having of babies is, is inextricably connected to the blessing of Abraham and the proposition that justification is by faith alone. You have to be born before you can be born again. You have to be born again before you go to heaven. And you know, God wants to populate heaven every, from every tongue and tribe and nation. Millions and billions of people <laughs> born all throughout the ages. Fifth, believing children are weapons for the kingdom of God. Solomon calls them arrows in Psalm 127, verse 4 and 5. They are means of contending with the enemies of God. If you want to change the culture, forget the arts, have children. I'll say that again. Forget the arts, have children, and, tr and bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. The Bible doesn't say that you change the world through the arts. You change the world through children who preach the gospel. Sixth, children are called blessings. Psalm 127, verse 5. Uh, they are blessings in many ways. They're a means of wealth and care and for the strengthening of the capacities of the family. You know, the, our society says children are a burden. And by the way, this is why millions of uh, women are killing their children. They're killing them. They're killing them so that their children don't weigh them down. They're killing them so that they can go to college. They're killing them because they don't want to have a bump on their belly. They're killing them because they want to have a career. Well, you know, in America, we'll commit murder for anything. What would you commit murder for? But children are blessings. They're not a burden at all. Seventh, they're called a heritage of the Lord. A heritage of the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 3. They, they preserve a heritage of godliness in future generations. Like the Rechabites. Oh, boy. We could talk about the Rechabites all day. But there was a legacy of faithfulness for hundreds of years going forward. They were a heritage of the, war, of the Lord. Eighth, the fruit of the womb is a reward. Psalm 127, verse 3. Children come back and help and strengthen their parents in their old age. And one of, the, one of the modern tragedies of low birth rates is that we've created a society where there's really nobody to take care of old people anymore. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to die in the death camps called nursing homes because there's nobody to take care of them. You know what? You know what old people need most of the time? They, 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 they don't need an antiseptic environment. They need puppies and children and activity. They need a family. Now, there, there are times when the proper care of someone might require some institutional care. It has to be done very carefully. But here's how God designed it. Families take care of families until they're dead. You know, my, my father remembers when, his, when, when somebody would die in their church, they would bring the body right into their living room, and the whole family would be there. The body would be in the living room of the family because the family took care of the family. Ninth, God promises to care for his redeemed who were born into this world. Hebrews 2.16, for indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. God gives aid. You know, God cares for children that are born into the world. Here's how Charles Spurgeon said it. He basically was saying, have babies. And then he says, don't, be, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He says, where God sends mouths, he also sends meat. How many of you have seen that happen? Yeah, it happens. You're like your children have been fed, you know. God cared for them. So there, there are reasons that, that you should uh, pursue fruitfulness and multiplication. And you know, having children is a temporal 
and earthly means to, to a spiritual and eternal end. And the, it, the, it, the earthly means for the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham come to pass because God's people are having children, have children, preach the gospel to them. It's not idolizing the family uh, that makes people want to have lots of children. It's faithfulness. Don't say that marriage and family are unimportant in God's plan. Don't make the mistake of saying, because marriage and family are temporal, they are inconsequential. They're not inconsequential. Because God is filling up heaven with babies who are born and then born again. And this is what we're put in the earth for, is to preach the gospel, to fill heaven. And that's why God gave us babies. Well, heaven starts with a marriage and sexual intimacy and childbirth. And heaven is populated as a result of the filling of the earth with many souls. It's good to fill the earth with souls. Don't, 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 don't let the ecological justice crowd tell you that it's unjust to have children. It's the best thing you can do. You know, it's, it's possible to blaspheme the Word of God by the way that you deal with womanhood. I want you to open your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. And I want you to look at verses 3 through 5 because, you know, as we're here dealing with the whole matter of womanhood, as we're dealing with the design of femininity, it's really critical that we understand what the Bible says and keep our coordinates to true north here. Here in Titus, he speaks to the older women that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So these are mature women, steady, they're rock solid, they're not fearful, they know who they are. Why? Verse 4, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now, the Bible here is saying that when a woman refuses to be a keeper at home, she, she causes the word of God to be blasphemed. In other words, she creates conditions that discredit the word of God, and it gives people a reason to rail against God instead of glorifying God, and the word of God ends up getting blasphemed. Now, there, there, there's, there's much to say about these verses. Here's one thing I want to say, you who are in churches. What's women's ministry? What should women's ministry look like in your church? Here's my view. It should look just like this. And by the way, this is what my wife does with our ladies. She gathers with them regularly. And she, here's what she does. She has, she has all of these things in her mind. This is all she does with her women in our church. And I commend the pattern to you. That whatever kind of women's ministry you have, make it look exactly like this. Don't make it, no, don't make it a place where women can come and cry on one another's shoulders. Make it, make it a place where they're admonished to go do what's good. And they might cry on one another's shoulders through the process, and that's good. To love their husbands, number one. To love their children, number two. To be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, to be good, to be obedient to their own husbands. Seven things so that the word of God wouldn't be blasphemed. Again, you have this laser beam focus of a woman. A woman knows who she is by the family life that she has been given. And the older women should laser beam instruct the younger women in these things and help them enjoy every manner of womanhood. It's such a glorious thing. And they, they need to understand how ridiculous it is to try to say that the engine should be the wing. No, the family needs the engine of a woman and the wing of a husband to provide direction.
And so God has established that women should be keepers of home, that the word of God might not be blasphemed. With, with something so important at stake, the blaspheming of the word of God, causing the word of God to be blasphemed, it's no wonder that homemaking is so viciously attacked. It's so casually undervalued. It is so easily dismissed. Don't you dismiss it on the authority of God. It's a beautiful thing. And it's no wonder that a biblically illiterate, historically ignorant Christian populace, i.e. evangelicalism, big Eva, they don't even know what the Bible says about motherhood. They don't even know what the Bible says about women's roles in the creation order. Because they don't take their Bible seriously. They don't want to be guided by the Bible. They want to be guided by their culture and be so relevant. Which is the quickest way to irrelevancy. You know, the rest of the story is that when women break the glass ceiling, there's a lot of blood on the ground. There really is. There are consequences from all the falling glass from breaking the glass ceiling. I hope you've seen it. It's there. You know, there's a high cost when women turn away from God's design to be chaste and keepers at home and help meets and mothers and teachers of children. There's a high cost when God says, Put your energy there, and they go, no, I'm going to go put it somewhere else. Because I have gifts. I am me. I can be whatever I want to be. No. Just look at your biological nature, and you'll tell you what you should do with your life. You know, these women get liberated to what? They have the scars to prove it. They have the workplace romances that destroyed their marriages. They got the psychotropic drugs to prove it. They've got their divorces. They've got their latchkey children. They've got their pregnant teens. They've got their Ritalin for their boys. They've got their impossible schedule of job and home and all the vulnerabilities that came with their independence. So when the glass ceiling broke, there was a lot of blood on the ground. And they have dead babies to prove it. You know, we need to consider the possibility that women today are experiencing levels of dissatisfaction and stress and unhappiness. Americans, American women are not very happy. That's why 70% of divorce papers are filed by women. It's not working out like they thought. They must not be all that fulfilled. Fem feminism made them dissatisfied with their lives to throw off what was obvious in their gender. And when the, when the, when the protective barrier is broken, and that protective barrier is the focus of a woman, when that protective barrier is broken, there's a lot of blood on the ground. And it causes the word of God to be blasphemed. It causes a hailstorm of evil to run over a society because children are not nurtured in the training and the admonition of the Lord. They didn't have mothers who cared for them who, and fathers who walked with them. But there's a better way for a husband-helping, home-centered, child-raising life that God ordained for the happiness of his daughters and their families. This is the beauty of, of home life. You know, home is a, the, a fountain of society. And, you know, women who have abandoned home life to spend their days in cubicles are the wrong role models. They defeat what's beautiful and good. And they lead a host of followers to do the same. And they end up going out there and working, working for companies that will pass away and pass into irrelevancy. All, all that needs to happen to wipe their companies out is another tech revolution that goes in a different direc direction. And all, the, all the, and all the contacts they made and all the papers they filed are just going to go in the trash can. But that's not true when you raise a baby. So I want us to see the importance of home life and what it's really all about. 
And don't, don't believe the gender injustice warriors. And remember that you were made to do something very specific and very wonderful. And let's don't play games with this. This has to do with nothing less than man being made in the image of God. This has to do with personhood. It has to do with who you are and what your function is in the world the way that God has designed it. The heart of the attacks of the devil are on the matter of personhood. Man made in the image of God. And that's why you should have lots of babies. And don't live in such a way that would allow the word of God to be blasphemed. Now let me just end with this. Here's my desire. You families, go for it. Plunge your whole life into God's design. It's a good design. It's a beautiful design. There's nothing better than his design. So go for it and be a real family and obey the commands of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, we have a 15-minute break now. Come back, and I'm going to give you some more applications.